me miss the negativity Call it how I see, yes I'm back in the vicinity Bringing what you need plus all of the amenities Know what you consider the run of the mill, running the drill None of it's real celebrity I don't let any of it get to me I am more a mystery, mentally and physically Yeah, I've seen the bright lights ever so vividly Party with the star type to mingle with the industry But jeez, we don't need another hero I relate to real people, not these self-centered weirdos Flamboyant wannabe, oh so flashy If you ask me, that really is a classy You'll never see me with my sunglasses on In a club, dancing on a table to my own song Getting buzzed, and you'll never see me With a couple bottles of Chris Trying to pick up on a chick like Bitch, you want this? That ain't classy Radio's playing my song yeah. I got a record label that's putting me on But I still stay classy yeah. Still stay classy, still stay classy I'ma do what I gotta do And if you're not relating, it's hard not to hate them Don't care what they say and I change it That ain't classy, that ain't classy That ain't classy, that ain't classy uh. Let's do it again. We're doing it again. This is another dream come true. It's so nice. I can literally see all of your faces, all of you. And I know all of you. I do. I literally know every person. I knew you either in real life or on Facebook or we've waved at Sobeys at each other. This is truly a dream. Uh, as most of you know, I, I moved here four years ago. I was very happy to be moving here. I was ready for my new life. But you have a very odd way in St. John of greeting people when they move here or visit here. It's not like anywhere else in the world, ladies and gents, no. If you move to another city like London or New York, people go, oh, you've just moved here. Welcome. You don't do that here in St. John, do you? No. <laughs> I moved here, I was all happy to be here, and every single person I met said the same thing. They didn't say welcome, they said, why the fuck did you move here? <laughs> you need to stop doing that, it's not helping. <laughs> I heard it so often, I honestly thought that when you drive into the city, the welcome sign would say, why the fuck have you come here? Although, let's be honest, it couldn't be any worse than be in this place. <laughs> I was truly just happy to be here, to be giving my kids a, a new life here. I was so happy, and I, ha I was happy to be in a safe place, because I come from South London, where every week there's murders, and it was just a horrible place to live, and I come here, and it's a safer, happier place, and people are saying, oh, no, no, James, it's not. And I'm saying, well, it is. My first year living here, this is absolutely true. My first year, there was one shooting in St. John all year. One shooting. The guy got shot in the leg, right? But he wouldn't press charges because I quote, my mate did it by accident at the camp. <laughs> How beautiful is that? That we have one shooting in a year and it's because someone was on a four-wheeler trying to do a wheelie over a river, bottle of rum in one hand, shotgun in the other, shot his mate in the leg on the Kingston Peninsula, obviously. <laughs> obviously. I love the Kingston Peninsula. It's so nice to be in a city where literally minutes away we have this lawless land. <laughs> Everything's defined there. There's no police there, like incest everywhere. <laughs> I've actually, I've actually been getting onto the, onto the ferry boat, the Gondola Point ferry boat, on the Kingston Peninsula side. And I've heard people going, I better sober up before I get to the other side. <laughs> Those KV cops are a fucking nightmare. <laughs> and then, 
And I was saying some people said to me, oh, no, no, James, you don't know. There's lots of dangerous streets in St. John. I went, ooh. I said, no, there's not, not compared to where I'm from. They said, ah, you haven't been down Waterloo Street then. I said, yes, I have, and I've been down Waterloo Street, and compared to the crime-ridden land I came from, the worst that's going to happen if you walk down Waterloo Street, I said, is that you might see someone sitting on a doorstep with a few less teeth than they'd like. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 James, you've got to go after dark. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to do this then, because I can't be going around saying it's safe here if I haven't checked it for myself. So I went down Waterloo Street at three o'clock in the morning. Not once, three times. Because a scientific experiment doesn't count unless you do it three times, right? Now I went to do this just for you, so you don't have to. Now here's the thing, it's not dangerous. Here's, this is, this is what happened to me. This is the worst that's going to happen if you walk down Waterloo Street at three o'clock in the morning, right? Walking along, this is how I walk sometimes, what of it, right? <laughs> I mean, you might have to stop once in a while and say something like, uh, no, 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 no crack for me today, thank you. So, all good for the crack, thank you. No, 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 I don't want a blow job, thank you very much. Um, all set for the blowies tonight, thank you. All set for the blowies. Nice tooth. All to the same person. <laughs> I love it. Beautiful place. But it was funny. Another thing that everyone said to me when, when I first got here, they said, oh, you know, after, why did you move here? They said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a, I, I'm a comedian. They said, oh, oh, we don't like comedy in New Brunswick. <laughs> You won't make a living here. And I, I believed them. So uh, you might know this. I spent the first six months that I moved here on the road. I said to my agent, I need to travel the rest of Canada because apparently New Brunswick hates comedy. I mean, luckily, we've proved those people wrong tonight with this turnout. So thank you very much indeed. But I don't know. So I went on the road and I performed everywhere else in Canada. Everywhere else in Canada. And, and I was away for literally five to six months. And in my last week, I did 16 shows in seven nights in Montreal, because who needs sleep? And on my first night in Montreal, I did an interview with a, with a journalist from the Montreal Gazette, which is the most widely read English-speaking newspaper in Quebec. And he was very interested. He came to see the show. He enjoyed it. But he was asking me about St. John, why I love it so much. And I was telling him. And I didn't know what the story was going to be. But the next morning, I pick up the Montreal Gazette, and the front page is my stupid face with these two well-trained caterpillars <laughs> above my eyes, right? And the headline simply said, James Mullinger is living the dream in St. John. <laughs> yes, yes. That's what I thought. I thought, that's got to be a good thing. That's got to be a good thing. Maybe the people in St. John will warm to me now, right? Then I got an email from another journalist from the Montreal Times who said, I've never been to St. John before, but now I'm going to go. Where should I go? And I told him. And this is true. I still have an email. I had an email from a couple in Vancouver who used to live in Montreal, so they read the paper every day online. And they were retired, they, and they moved to Vancouver, and then they, they, they read the article and said, we're going to now come to the East Coast for the first time. I thought, that's got to be a good thing for St. John. So I arrived back in St. John two weeks later, right? And I'm walking around uptown going, oh thinking I'm going to be, you know, well-received from this nice headline. And I'm saying, did everyone see the, uh, see the James Mullinger's living the dream in St. John headline? And they all went, yeah, we fucking saw it. <laughs> Turned out, everyone's slagging me off, going, he doesn't live in St. John, he lives in fucking Rosso. <laughs> What have you got to do to win people over here? <laughs> the, the, the divisions here are ridiculous. It's like South African era of apartheid. <laughs> it's even worse in the valley, like Rosse and Quizpam Sissa at war. <laughs> Seriously, like you can't, like there's a Dairy Queen on the Rosse Quizpam Sis border, right? One side of the sign promotes Quizpam Sis news, 
the other side promotes Rosé news and there's a line down the middle that you can't cross if you're from the wrong side. <laughs> a boy from Rosé can't date a girl from Chris Pam says it's like fucking West Side Story. <laughs> but again, I didn't know I lived in Rosé. I knew I lived on the Rosé Road, but I thought I lived in the Greater St. John area. Like my wife grew up on the peninsula and that was always St. John to me. I didn't know about all of these divisions and boundaries, right? But I thought, well, it's good to know where I live, right? Change the address labels, might start getting some fucking mail. Lovely, right? <laughs> so then I thought, right, well, I, I live in Rosé. Then a couple of weeks later, I met a lady in the street. She comes up to me and she says, uh, oh, it's you, the, uh, the comedian. Uh, I heard you on the, the CBC. And I said, oh, yeah. She goes, well, where do you live? And I said, well, I thought I lived in St. John, but it turns out I live in, uh, in Rosé. And she goes, where? 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 Because that's how they talk in Rosé. I don't know if you know that. It's... <laughs> well, it's a vocal intonation brought on by extreme wealth and incest. <laughs> she said, well, well. And I said, well, I live in between the wharf and the golf course. She said, you don't live in Rosse, you live in Renforth. Where the fuck do I live? <laughs> How's anyone supposed to know where they live in this place? Why is there 50 different names for the same area? No wonder we can't get anyone to come here. When they do come, we ask them why the fuck they came. And they don't know where to come because there's 50 different names and every, everyone's at war. It's like East Side versus West Side. Fucking Grand Bay's at war with everyone, right? It's, <laughs> Insanity. We've got to work together. So then I'm like, right, change the address labels again. At least now I know I live in Renforth. I was a bit confused because I thought I don't live in a fucking lighthouse. I don't know why. I'm like, okay, Renforth it is. And a few weeks after that, I'm doing a gig uh, at a vineyard on the Kingston Peninsula. And the guy that owns it, uh, he asked me, he turned out he was the mayor of Renforth in the 1980s. Right? And he said, uh, he said, so where do you live? And I said, well, I, live in, I thought I lived in St. John, then I thought I lived in Rosse. It turns out I live in Renforth. And he goes, wah, wah, wah. Because if you spend too long there, it rubs off on you. And he said, where? And I said, well, I live in between the wharf and the golf course. And he said, you don't live in Renforth. You live in East Riverside. I'm like, I'm getting, I, how are you supposed to keep up? All I know is, when I moved here, I flew into French Village Airport. <laughs> and I'm not sure what it is people want me to do, like, it's easier if we just group them together. We're all St. John together. We're all one and the same. We're celebrating this beautiful place. We're all the same. <laughs> We've got so much to offer collectively. And I don't know what it is people want me to do. Like, do they really think that it's helpful if I go on the road and do a tour and I perform somewhere in the world and the headline comes out and it says James Mullinger is living the dream in East Riverside? <laughs> and then the couple in Vancouver are going, darling, we must go to this East Riverside. It sounds amazing. And he's going, well, I'm trying to book tickets, but I can't find an airport <laughs> in East Riverside. Well, there must be one, darling. The English comedian lives there. No, it just appears to be a fucking dog walking park. <laughs> Good times. Thanks for being here, everyone. <laughs> I always say, if you're suffering from a problem in the present, you need to look to the past for the solution. So what is the solution to this problem, whereby we're all, all these different areas of the Greater St. John area are at war with each other? So I looked back to some tourist brochures from the 1950s to see how they handled this little problem. And I brought it for you tonight just to show you. <laughs> how do you deal with all of the wonderful things we have to offer collectively? They nailed it in the 1950s. Here we go. St. John, New Brunswick and vicinity. <laughs> and you know the best thing about having the words and vicinity? 
you can devote 30 pages at the back to the well-known Greater St. John area of fucking Fredericton. <laughs> and some of you are going to be right now kind of sitting there quite uncomfortable in your seats because I know how angry you all get when you see someone write st.john. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is a risky area I'm going into now, but I'm going to take a chance on this. Here is my theory, ladies and gents. I think you all need to chill the fuck out about the st.john thing. Because <laughs> here's what happens, right? James Taylor comes here, has a wonderful time. A wonderful time, explores the city, meets us, falls in love with us. He, has the, he says that we're the friendliest people. And then he'll be on his private jet back to the States and he'll be tweeting, had a wonderful time in st.john. And underneath, thousands of people are going, fuck you, James Taylor! <laughs> It's Saint, not ST dot. <laughs> Kevin Smith, same thing. He comes here and he goes, Oh, I had a wonderful time in St. John. I want to come back and shoot my new movie here. Love you, St. John, ST John. John. Hundreds of people going, Fuck you, Kevin Smith. <laughs> right? And I know, see, I've turned you already. You all sat there going, No, you've gone too far now, Mullinger. <laughs> you've gone too far. You're going to fuck off back to N dot. <laughs> um. But I do love vintage tourist guides. I mean, I study all of them. This one, uh, this one I thought was a very good thing. I always say that if you're trying to sell any city, if you can try and sell a city in the same way you might sell a prostitute, <laughs> you're onto a good thing. Which is why, in 1964, St. John was known as the ready and willing port. And this one I found absolutely fascinating. I don't know if you all knew this, but in, in the 1940s, the way that PEI was promoted, PEI was sold as the England of Canada. <laughs> the England of Canada. I mean, I don't really get that because I left England and it didn't cost me 45 fucking dollars to leave. <laughs> And I love PEI, and I'll be honest, I've never gone to PEI and thought to myself, wow, the food's shit and their teeth are terrible. <laughs> it's funny, um, people often ask me if I miss anything about London. And, and I'll be honest, I, I miss absolutely nothing. Obviously people, but I don't miss anything about the daily grind whatsoever. Because, I, mean, I mean, some of you, how many people have been on the London Underground, the tube trains? Yeah. <laughs> It's a barbaric experience. For any, for any normal Londoner, any normal person, you're basically leaving your apartment, which is the size of this area, right? You're living there with your wife, and the house probably costs like a million pounds, right? Then you walk to the tube station, and you get down into the tube, and there'll literally be just thousands of people on the platform. Every single tube station, thousands. More people on one platform than there are in all of New Brunswick, basically, right? <laughs> You'd get down there and you'd think, oh my God, it's packed down here and you'd be squeezed in at the back and then you'd hear the train coming. You'd think, jolly good, the train's coming and the train would come and the doors would open and it'd be full. And I don't mean New Brunswick full, like every seat taken. I mean the doors open and people are going, Bleh! fucking zombies falling out, right? And I should point out, it's total silence on these platforms. Like, there's thousands of people, not a word. No, everyone's just so depressed, they're just standing there. <laughs> not a word, right? Not like here, right? In fact, the only time you ever hear anyone ever speaking on London public transport, always a bloody Canadian. <laughs> always. And it's always like they come down and see, see the mass of people. They're like, oh my God, has there been a bomb? Has there been a riot? <laughs> no, this is how we live. Now, I'll give you an example. This is normal etiquette. So basically, you would stay on this platform for about an hour. The trains would come, they'd be full, they'd come every three minutes, and you'd edge forward bit by bit. So again, wonderful thing about living in New Brunswick is you can go months, if not years, without making physical contact with another human being. <laughs> that you're not choosing to make physical contact with, right? By the time you get on the train, you've had your elbow in five anuses, your face in someone's armpits, you're just, it's just agony. So you eventually get to the front of the tube, and then the next train comes, and it's full, but you squeeze on, and three of you will get on. And this is kind of normal, just to be like this, that's normal. <laughs> and then 
at the last minute, someone who'll get on, it's just because this is normal, but not being able to breathe is too much, right? So the person would get on and they would push the rest of you in and suddenly you're just unable to breathe. And now I, I must point out, this is not isolated. This is a standard way to travel. And what I'm about to tell you is standard English etiquette. What would happen is the three of you who just got on before this person, you'd look at each other. You wouldn't say anything because it's silent, but you'd look at each other as if to go, are we, are we doing this? <laughs> yeah, we're doing this. And what you'd do is you'd wait till the doors were just about to close. Like you'd hear the beep, 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 and all three of you at once, push the fucker out like that. <laughs> Every day, not considered rude in any way. The person would fall back like this and they'd go, yeah, fair enough. I did that to five people yesterday. <laughs> what of it, right? That's where I'm from. I now live in a place where I can wait half an hour for the Gondola Point ferry boat. <laughs> get onto the Gondola Point ferry boat, get halfway across the water, some moron arrives 20 minutes late, <laughs> we will go back to get that person. And best of all, and most importantly, every single person on that boat is thinking, yes, this is absolutely the right thing to do. <laughs> That's why I live here, right there. That's it. I'll give you another example. Uh, I, I started taking the, uh, the, the, the Comex bus in from the Rosso Road into St. John. I tell you why I started taking the bus, because I've become, I mean, I come from a place where literally it took three hours to do a 20 minute drive, but I've become such a St. Johnner now that literally I've become that person who's like, oh my God, traffic was a nightmare. <laughs> there were four people in front of me coming off the highway this morning, four people. <laughs> so I started taking the bus, right? And, it, and it's nothing like an English bus. It's just beautiful. Like I, I get on the bus, I walk in, the driver's all nice. He's like, hello. I'm like, hello. I'm like, I can't believe it, so nice. At the back of the bus, there's a group of people chatting. They probably take the bus together every day. They're all just chatting friendly. I can see the seats, like there's actual seats available. <laughs> and, and, and they haven't been like scarred with a knife or anything. They're just, no one's written the word shit in shit on the window. <laughs> just beautiful. Literally, I mean, you go, for, for me, going onto a bus in St. John is like going into like British Airways first class. It's just <laughs> luxury. So I get on the bus and I, and I sit down. And I'm just loving the experience. I'm so happy. I'm just enjoying it. And then the bus drives for about five or six minutes and the people are chatting and it's all just nice, nice, nice. And then we stop at a bus stop. Uh, we, we stopped at the stop where Colwell's used to be. <laughs> And we're at the stop. Now, we're sitting there for about five, six, seven minutes, not moving. Now, that would never happen in England. Like, in England, if a bus stopped for more than a minute, every man, woman, and child on that bus would basically start a riot. <laughs> Everyone would be punching the driver in the face repeatedly <laughs> until the bus moved on, right? That's normal practice. But I'm having to be one of you guys. I'm having to be a New Brunswicker, so I'm trying to be New Brunswick James. And what we have to do all the time when nothing is good, we have to just go... Because <laughs> I will say this, right? I mean, I love living here more than life itself, right? And I, I don't miss anything about the pace of life in London. I don't miss that whole everything had to be done yesterday mentality. I don't miss that whole kind of like, when's the deadline last week? When do you need it yesterday? Go, go, go. I don't miss that. But now, living here and trying to get things done, I have a different outlook where I'm like, well, it'd be nice if it happened some fucking time. <laughs> so... So I'm on the bus, and the bus is sat there. Now, I'm, I'm late for a meeting at this point, so I'm trying to be New Brunswick James, but London James is, is coming through. Some of the old rage is coming through, and I'm, I'm sat there, I'm trying to stay calm, trying to be... Yeah. But the rate... And they're just chatting, and there's been no announcement. The driver's reading the paper. Now... <laughs> I know. Now, I'm not proud of this, but I will be honest with you, I did lose my temper. I, did, I, I, I broke out into New Brunswick's version of a full-scale riot. 
And now please strap in, I'm not proud of this, but I, I did do this, and, and please don't judge me for it, but I, was, I didn't get up, I stayed in my chair for this. But I, I broke out into a full-scale run. I, I, I did this, I went... <laughs> they all fucking froze. The driver dropped his paper. One woman even said, oh my God, it's all kicking off. And I felt terrible, I felt, I felt horribly guilty about this, right? Anyway, this is an absolutely true story. One of the guys at the back of the bus, right, he, he was trying to placate the situation. He goes, oh, sorry, uh, you don't know, do you? I said, no, why would I know? There's been no announcement. We've been sitting here for almost 10 minutes. What, what, what's going on? You know, what is it? And he goes, well, I don't know for sure, but I think we're probably sat here waiting because uh, John normally gets on at this time. <laughs> The driver turns around and goes, yeah, that's right, John normally gets on now, he's not here. <laughs> Would you rather live in a place where nobody speaks to anyone or a place when the bus driver doesn't even need to tell people why we're there, they all just fucking know? <laughs> that's a victory right there. That's a victory. I briefly referenced, referenced this a moment ago, but I think one of the things that I struggled with most when I first got here was indeed the way in which you guys give directions. <laughs> it is, without question, unlike anywhere else in the world, right? You ask people for directions in London, England, or, or New York, or any other city or town in the world. They, they, will, they will say, oh, I, I went to visit my mum, for example, a few months ago. She'd moved to a new town. I was trying to find the pub. They said, oh, you turn left at the, at the library, turn right at the cathedral, and you'll get to the pub. Wonderful, right? Wonderful. She used local landmarks. You don't do that in New Brunswick, do you? <laughs> no. You give directions using landmarks of shit that used to be there <laughs> 25 fucking years ago. <laughs> it's even worse in the rural areas. I was trying to find a gig in Sussex about six months ago. I got lost, I asked someone for directions, and I swear to God, word for word, he says to me, go to the end of this road and turn left at the tree where Donnie crashed his bike in 78. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> but I've had to get used to this, and, and it, it all came to a head, it all came to a head, ladies and gentlemen. I got, I got lost one day, I found myself at, uh, I got lost, I found myself at Lancaster Mall. Do we all know Lancaster Mall? Yeah. I love Lancaster Mall. If you don't know Lancaster Mall, just picture the mall in Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> and imagine it with a few more zombies in it. And you're... Oh, well. So I got lost, right? And, and, and I, I saw a lady, I was trying to find... Because my, my wife likes to send me out on little jobs during the day, right? Just to stop me indulging in my favourite hobby of... Um, Drinking all day. <laughs> so she said, you know, it's like the world's worst scavenger hunt. She's like, go to this flooring company, take a picture of a floor. I'm like, well, what floor? Any fucking floor, just out of the house. So I'm trying to find B&N flooring. So I went up to this lady. Oh, they're in the house. Give it up for B&N flooring. World-class flooring company. World-class, world-class flooring company. See, we all know and love them. That's the beautiful thing about this place. So I went up to this lady, she looks smart, she looks like one of us, right? A, a, a born and bred St. John, she obviously knew what was what. I said, excuse me, madam, do you know the way to B&N flooring? And she said, yes, I do. I said, wonderful, I'm in safe hands here. And I swear to God, word for word, this is the first thing she says. She goes, do you know where Zellers used to be? <laughs> do I look or sound like I know where Zellers used to be? I don't even know what a fucking Zellers is. <laughs> now, I now know from my research that the building in question, the building to which she was referring, was actually behind where I was standing. It was in her field of vision. She could see the building. And it's now quite a well-known established chain called Bloody Walmart. <laughs> she could see the Walmart sign in the periphery of her vision 
but she still calls it where Zellers used to be. <laughs> now, the day this happened, I was, I was just flummoxed, ladies and gents. And that night, I was doing a gig at Yuck Yucks here in St. John, and I was on stage telling this story exactly as I'm telling it to you. And I got to this point in the story, and a woman at the back of the room stood up, quite angry, and said, she's obviously not a true St. John then. I said, why is that? She said, because if she was, she would have said it's where Kmart used to be. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I've had lots of, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but I, 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 basically all my dreams have come true since, since, since moving here. I mean, I've been a massive fan of CBC's The Debaters uh, for, for at least a decade, and I never thought in a million years I'd get to perform on it. Oh, a few fans. For those that don't know, it's a, um, it's a show where two comedians are put head to head to argue for and against a certain argument. So I finally got the call uh, last year, and I was so excited, and then they told me what my motion was, what I was in favour of. The subject that I was arguing in favour of, of was, um, fog is wonderful. <laughs> I think they thought to themselves, well, here's a man that moved from the second foggiest city in the world to the number one fucking foggiest city. <laughs> this man knows his fog. So I'm told, I'm told you're going to be flying uh, uh, to Halifax and, and it's at the, uh, uh, the Rebecca Cohn Auditorium. It's like a thousand seater, very exciting. I'm, I'm all excited, I've written my script, I, I feel prepared. Um, I arrive at St. John Airport to fly to Halifax. <laughs> my flight gets cancelled because of fog. Um, but that was one highlight of last year, but it wasn't the, the pinnacle. The, for me, the greatest thing that happened to me last year, ladies and gents, was that I finally had my vasectomy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, lots of vasectomy fans in the house. Oh, the ladies are still like, he's good to go, he's good to go. <laughs> yes, Britain's beauty's down there. <laughs> he's good to go. By way of a cheer, how many men in here have had the pleasure of a vasectomy? Yes, good on you, Mark Stanley's at it, yes, yes, yeah, It's the great, I, I have to say this, there is only one thing worse for a man than having a vasectomy, and that is having your vasectomy in Sussex. <laughs> Who knew that was even a thing? Because you go into the St. John Regional to have the, to have the consultation, Right? And you walk into St. John Regional, and it's an amazing, impressive building, and you walk in, and you look around and say, yes, this looks like the kind of place that I would trust anyone to cut my ball sack open. <laughs> and I had the little consultation, because you have to be approved for the vasectomy. So they do a little interview with you for five minutes, and then, and then he said at the end, he said, yes, you qualify, because you clearly hate both your fucking kids. <laughs> And then he hands me the slip. And it says Sussex. I said Sussex. I mean, you don't go into Sussex and think, yes, this is the place for the, right? You know what I pictured when I saw the word Sussex on my appointment slip? I pictured that agriculture museum <laughs> next to the Sussex flea market. I thought, am I gonna be lying in a field watching a rusty combine harvester? come forward to cut me open with nothing but homemade wine as anaesthetic. <laughs> but I will say this, um, some comedians would, would take this, you know, make this a bit gross and graphic, I won't do that, I, I don't want to offend anyone, I will say this, Sussex, fair play, it was absolutely slick. It went completely to plan, right? Beautiful job, couldn't be happier. And it's funny, I mean, I think we all remember, we all remember the moment in which we decide, we realise we need the vasectomy, don't we? We all remember that scary moment. Yes, there's lots of women nodding more here, and that's why it, that says it all. For me, it was, I remember it vividly, it was the third Sunday morning in a row that I'm lined up at Shoppers Drug Mart clutching the morning after pill for dear life. <laughs> My wife's texting me going, you better come home quick or start praying it's the fucking afternoon after pill as well. <laughs> 
And I'm terrified, right? And the lineup's not moving, and I want to get home quickly, and I'm panicking, and I'm, I'm, I'm there thinking, I've got to get through this lineup quickly, I've got to get through it. Because this isn't that like, in England, there's millions of people, but because no one talks, lineups move quickly. You walk into a store in England, there'll be 100 people in a lineup, get to the back, blink, and it's gone. No one speaks, they, we don't even make eye contact, done. It's not quite like that here, is it? <laughs> no. No, I mean, even when, you know, when you're doing the weekly shop in Sobeys, right? And we all do the same thing. We try and scope out what's the best line, don't we, right? With military precision. You're like, oh no, too many full shopping carts there. Then you're like, that one looks good. She's only got a basket. You take a closer look and you're like, oh no, fruit, that shit needs weighing. <laughs> and then you clock the perfect line, don't you? The perfect line, the lady with just a basket and one bottle of milk in there, one carton of milk. You're like, this is the lineup for me. So you get in there proudly thinking this is going to be quick. But what you haven't banked on is that Mavis hasn't seen Doris for a couple of weeks. And she wants to know what went down at Chase the Ace last week. <laughs> In some detail. We just get held up. So there I am, standing in the lineup at Shoppers Drug Mart, sweating, clutching the morning after pill. They're chatting away. Again, I can't get angry like I would have done in London. I'm having to do my usual New Brunswick thing of. <laughs> but it's terrifying. All I can think to myself is I've got two kids and I didn't really want the second fucker. So you have the operation, it all goes to plan, and, and, the, and the men will remember this. And, and you think the operation is going to be the tough part, but it's not. The operation is the perfect part. When you're dealing with the professionals, as we have here in New Brunswick, it's, it's an easy operation. However, after you have the operation, they say to you, um, uh, Mr. Mullinger, um, you mustn't have any sexual activity for two weeks. I said, is that shared or solo? They said, you need to come back in for what they like to call the test. Do we all know what they mean by the test? The test is a very polite way of saying the only guilt-free wank you'll ever have in your life. <laughs> it's the only time in your life when you masturbating is on the family calendar on the fridge. <laughs> any other situation. Every morning, my kids are going, what time's daddy's test? Why are you? My mother-in-law arrives at the door going, it's the test this afternoon. Do you want to ride? Why do you know? <laughs> Why does everyone, there's never another instance in life where any of us would tell anyone, like Joel, uh, where, where, where do you work again, Joel? I work at a food factory. At a food factory. Now, obviously, like everyone in this room, you masturbate at work, right? That's a good one, right? <laughs> When you go to the washroom to crank one out, you would never stand up and go, OK, I'm gonna, not going to be doing any more food packaging. I'm off for a quick one, right? You would never <laughs> do that. You just go off quietly, right? You, men, male or female, you don't tell people when you're going to do it. Like when my wife sends me down to the basement, because we've run out of kitchen roll in the kitchen, and she sends me down and I come back up, I'm not going to tell her why there's a few sheets off of the bounty roll <laughs> from the stronger soaker up. Oh, am I? No. It's a private business. So why is it suddenly this test, everyone knows about it? So I'm, I'm mortified by this. I'm so embarrassed that everyone knows that I'm going to this place. So I said to the hospital, I said, listen, is there an alternative to this option? They said, well, yes, Mr. Mullinger, th 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 there is actually. Um, you can um, produce the sample at home. You know what that means. <laughs> and bring it into the hospital and we'll do the test here. I said, that sounds wonderful. What's the catch? She said, well, it does need to be 15 minutes fresh. <laughs> I said, but I live 30 minutes from the fucking hospital. <laughs> I said, does that mean when I pull off the highway onto the Prom Foster Thurston, <laughs> I need to start jerking off in the car. And have you been down that road? 
You see that? Well, can you imagine coming along the pump? Oh, 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 oh. I'm new in town. I don't want to get pulled over by the cops. Woo, woo, catch that, mate. I said, no way. I said, I'm not doing that. No way. I'm coming in. So I go in, right? And it was as embarrassing as I thought. I walk into the area, and there's about 20 or 30 people there. And again, I know at least half of them from Facebook and the other half from the Sobeys, right? <laughs> and we all know why we're there. And I walk up to the counter very sheepishly, and there's three women behind the counter. Of course, I know two of the three. One I met because this beautiful and wonderful woman once, um, my, my eldest son once wrote a, a letter in a bottle, wrote a letter, put it in a bottle, threw it out into the Kennebecasis River. It landed on this woman's beach. Being a St. Johnna, rather than throwing it in the bin, she wrote him a little reply from a lost boy on a... On, a, on an island and delivered it to our door and made my son smile like I've never seen him smile in my life. That was the first time I meet her. The second time I meet her, hello, I need to jerk off. <laughs> That's not how I want to meet people. Anyway, they were very respectful, all of them. And, and she said, OK, Mr. Mullinger, um, there's a bathroom down there on the left. You need, to, um, you need to fill this pot. I said, fill it? <laughs> what is this, fucking pickaroons? <laughs> but then she hands me a, a pot. And I'm not joking, the pot is about that big and about this small at the top. <laughs> and I'm looking at this thing going, I'm not sure that I can definitely guarantee... <laughs> that I can definitely... And she's like, what do you mean, Mr. Mullinger? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm not sure. Because let's be honest, masturbation is not that precise an art, is it? <laughs> like, no one kind of mas no, no one masturbates like, ooh, 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 right? It's not a... And, and I'm not just being a bloke about it. It's the same for the ladies. Like, I know, when everyone's out of the house and you run a nice bubble bath, right? <laughs> yes, she knows. <laughs> Put Adele on the iPod, right? It's a wild and crazy business. The bubbles are spilling over. There's about 2,000 women looking at me right now going, how the fuck did you know that? <laughs> All I'm saying is sometimes I leave the nanny cam on when I leave the house. <laughs> so I'm looking at this point going, well, I, I, just, I, just, I just can't guarantee. And at this point, I look around. All 20 people in the waiting area have leant forward like, I dare you to say it. And I go, well, I said, I said, here's the thing. I said, I don't know that I can definitely... I said, here's the thing. I said, I like to move around a bit when I'm doing it. <laughs> like, my hands are shaking and my knees are weak. I can't seem to stand on my own two feet. Who do you think of when you have a such luck? I'm in love. <laughs> I'm all shook up. Right, that's... <laughs> Good luck enjoying that song on 97.3 The Wave next week. You will always picture that image. <laughs> so this she seems to understand. And she goes, oh, I think I understand, Mr. Manager. I, I think I understand. And I swear to God, this is absolutely true. I've got 20 witnesses to this, some of which will be in this room. She turns around and hands me a second identical little cup. So I'm kind of looking at these cups going, well, have you got anything bigger? Maybe a three-liter ice cream tub? <laughs> So, no, this is it. And at this point, I'm so embarrassed, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so kind of mortified by this whole situation. I thought, I'm just going to have to do this, right? I, I took the two little cups, and I thought to myself, I guess I'm just going to have to think of this as like one of those lawn games at the Algonquin. <laughs> Which one's going to be the winner? <laughs> so I went off to the bathroom very sheepishly. I put the cups down, and um, as it turned out, the winner was the bloody war. <laughs> That's right, this gig is not being filmed for CBC, so... <laughs> One of the greatest things, I think, about that last show uh, two years ago being released internationally was the fact that we didn't know that was going to happen. Like, we were filming it, obviously, for, for City on Fire, for the, for the documentary about St. John, 
and then it got picked up by Hulu and Amazon Prime after the fact. So normally when you're doing a special that you know is going to be released internationally, you soften some of the local references to make it more palatable for an international audience. I did that gig that night just for all of you, which means that there's people, I mean, you go onto Amazon.com, the American site, there's lots of people going, I don't know what this guy's talking about, I've never heard of Sobeys, where's King Street, right? <laughs> But the best comment I've ever had was that uh, a guy called Nick Sullivan, who's the fashion director of American Esquire magazine, commented on my Instagram feed last week. He said, just watched your stand-up special. Very funny. Now I desperately need to go to the three mile. <laughs> that is how you promote St. John. Talk about the three mile on a special. Sorry, dry mouth. <laughs> I should point out, my vasectomy doctor is sitting right there. <laughs> Give it up for Dr. Scott Bagnall! <laughs> the master! And the fact is, the fact is that this is, I, I, I do believe this to be the greatest place in the world to live right now, and here's why. If you go to New York or go to London, there's people walking around who've lived there for years, walking around just basically complaining, kind of like we do, but they're walking around and they're going, oh my God, oh my God, New York was so much better 10 years ago. They're going, London's ruined. It was so much better 20 years ago. But the great thing about living in St. John right now with all of the boom and all of the amazing things that are happening, the amazing bars and restaurants and culture and all of the wonderful things we have happening is that no one is walking around St. John right now going, much better 10 years ago. <laughs> Which basically means, if you're living in St. John, because it gets better every day, it means that if you live here, every day is the best day of your life, right? And every single day, it gets better. And I love the fact that, oh, well, it's true. That park here, these here, they, um... And I love the fact that, I love the fact that Canada is kind of appearing on the world stage now. Like, you know, for many years it was somewhat ignored, but now people are looking at us and going, how can they be so close to America and yet so happy and so peaceful? Um, there was a, um, a cover story in England on The Economist magazine, it said Canada is leading the way in Western and liberal values. And then the New York Times did a thing where they do the 100 best places in the world to visit. Every year it's always a city is number one. Last year it was just all of Canada, right? And that's a beautiful thing. And then within Canada, everybody's looking to New Brunswick. Because for many years, you know those surveys they do every year, where are the happiest people in Canada, right? And it's always New Brunswick. And for many years, when people elsewhere in Canada read that, they thought it was because we were just fucking morons going, this is great. <laughs> this is great, right? But now people are starting to see that it actually is amazing here. And I, I love that. And this is the thing, I mean, this thing, right? There's Justin Trudeau, right? There, lots of people might not like some of his policies. However, what is remarkable is that we do have the sexiest prime minister in world history, right? <laughs> That, and that counts for something on the world stage, right? Before Trudeau, I had never masturbated over a prime minister before. <laughs> well, I say that, Margaret Thatcher once, but I was young. <laughs> and I love the fact that, 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 that everything's that people are noticing here. But however, one thing that's changed is I loved the fact that all of my friends from England and Australia and America would see the pictures on Instagram and see how beautiful it was, and then they would go, James, it looks amazing, we're going to come and visit, and they would come and bring their tourism dollars, and that was a good thing. But in the last few months, those phone calls have changed slightly, right? Now the phone calls go a bit like this. They go, James, James, Brexit's a bloody nightmare. Your life in New Brunswick looks amazing. What have we got to do to move there? And my American friends are phoning me going, James, James, we've accidentally elected a fucking moron. <laughs> Your life in New Brunswick looks amazing. What have we got to do to move there? And I'm having to say, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. Because as we all know, the reason New Brunswick is so awesome is because it's just us. The last thing any of us need is every limey prick I came here to get away from, swanning in and ruining what we've got going on. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't normally agree with any of the policies of President Trump, but I think we're going to have to build a bloody wall around New Brunswick 
and make the Brits and the Americans pay for it. Um, now, there's, uh, there's two ways we can end this show, ladies and gents. I've got two endings planned for you. I've got a clean ending and a slightly dirtier ending. Uh, I'd like to hear any applause for the, the clean ending. <laughs> Who would like the dirty ending? <laughs> Just to check that you are all on board, I'm going to do what we call in the game a little tester joke just to see if you are equipped to deal with the story I wish to tell. Um, and this is a, this is a true story. Um, and John may have experienced this, he may not. Um, a few weeks before I turned 40, a thing happened to me, which anyone that's experienced this will remember it. It's one of those momentous occasions in your life. You never forget it, right? It's like losing your virginity, you know. You never forget this day. Um, it was that day, ladies and gentlemen, that I found my very first Grey pubic hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all we all remember. Yep, yeah, Dr. Bagnall's there going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you don't see it coming, do you? You don't see it coming. It felt like any normal day. I had no idea this was coming. I woke up. I remember it was a Monday morning. Felt like any other day. Walked into the bathroom. Looked in the mirror, and there it was. I went, ah, oh, the fucking wife. <laughs> Correct response from most of you. Those that ooze that joke, I will tell you this. My wife wrote that fucking joke. And by ooing it, you're basically being bad feminist because you're implying that women aren't allowed to write dirty jokes. It's 2018, grow the fuck up. So I will tell you this, if there's, if there's one message or moral that I think I have generally in life, I, I, I object to people complaining about their lot. I think a lot of what I've talked about over the years here is I hate he hearing people complain about life in St. John. Uh, you know, look around. It's a beautiful place full of beautiful people. Embrace where you live. This is what has always been my message, the thing I've wanted to celebrate, right? I hate hearing people complain about, about where they live, and I hate people complaining about their marriages uh, or their relationships. And I think, you know, if you're lucky enough to have found another person to be with, you shouldn't be complaining. I've never understood hearing couples complain, male or female, like people having these kind of unrealistic expectations. And because they complain, we're, we're doing young people a disservice. Because we complain and we say, oh, oh the, my sex life's not what it used to be. Well, you're having sex. You know, you're, you're lucky, right? It's a good thing, don't complain. And because we're complaining, young people hear it and they're being more and more promiscuous than ever. Whereas the reality is, if you're lucky enough to have found another human being to spend your life with who is willing to have sex with you once every four or five months, you're blessed. <laughs> Embrace that, celebrate that, don't disparage it. I don't understand, we're, we're so selfish as a human race. Like the, the way in which people are like, oh, but it's nothing like Fifty Shades of Grey. It's not supposed to be. Only the human race would be so selfish as to be given this, this gift from God or nature or whatever you believe, right? That we're given these body parts that you put them together and people have, you have the greatest feeling in the world, right? It's already perfect. The art of sex, male, or male, and, male and female or female and female and male and male, regardless, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Only the human race would be so selfish as to go, well, I want it to be like if I put a rubber glove over my head. Why? I mean, by all means, do that, but don't complain, right? Embrace what you have, cherish what you have. And the thing I hate hearing most is when people say, uh, they say in marriage, there's no surprises anymore. There's no surprises. Well, I am here to dispel that myth, ladies and gents, right? A few weeks ago, my wife and I were making the love. <laughs> we're making the love, right? Now, again, it was, I don't know how, it was, I won't say the normal way, but this is how we do it. <laughs> is this how you're all doing it these days? I don't know, right? We're making the love, and I'm as happy as I get. I'm not there thinking, my God, this is, uh, why haven't I got a rubber glove over my head? Why isn't she spanking me? I'm not thinking that. I'm as happy as I get. I'm with the woman I love, the mother of my children, and I'm plugged in, ladies and gents. That's. <laughs> That's as good as it gets in life. If you're plugged in, celebrate it, right? 
I wasn't there thinking, why are there no whips? Why aren't we doing this? I'm at the peak of my happiness. When I'm making love to the woman I love, most in the world who gave me two beautiful children, brought me to this beautiful city, I'm at the peak of my happiness. I was not expecting more. However, suddenly, out of the blue, she pulled out of the bag like a, a special move downstairs. <laughs> special move. Now, I don't know what the special move was, but what I do know is, I liked it. <laughs> I went from the happiest I get to a whole different level of happy. Now, every lady has her own special move, right? And it's not a gentleman's place to ever ask what the special move is. Ladies, you know, you keep these special moves under wraps, and rightly so, right? I don't know what anyone's special moves are, right? And it's not my place to ask. But, I mean, for example, madam, I don't, you obviously have a special... Like, what's... <laughs> Could be anything. Could be, I don't know, clamp, finger up the bum, right? <laughs> I guessed it, I guessed it. It's a, it's a little skill I've got, right? The special move, right? Now, now, no lady would ever, and I'd never felt this special move before, but all I know was I was happy as, it couldn't be better, right? 18 years together, lovely. Now, every lady, you, you, you never waste a special move on a first date, do you? No, 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 no. You save the special move, right? Save it till you've been dating for six months or a year, and you go, he hasn't proposed yet. <laughs> Maybe if I pull out the special move tonight. <laughs> and that's how it works. You'll be making the love, and he'll be very happy, and then suddenly you'll pull out the special move, in her case, right? <laughs> Suddenly, he goes from extremely happy to a whole different level of ecstasy, and he goes, ha, 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 will you marry me? <laughs> it's the genius of the special move, right? Now, I've been with my wife 18 years. Question, what the fuck was she waiting for? <laughs> That's 17 birthdays. 17 birthdays, she's been lying there thinking, nah, fuck him. The wedding night, seven years ago, we are, we are on our wedding night, we are in Toronto, we are in a suite at the Drake Hotel, there is rose petals everywhere, she's wearing a ring that costs more than I make in three months, a dress that costs six months salary, everything was perfect and she's lying there thinking, I'll save it for a special occasion. <laughs> and she saves the move up for 18 long years and then decides to pull it out of the bag on a rainy Tuesday night in New Brunswick. <laughs> but I wasn't thinking any of this at the time, no. I was too busy just basically in love with life, in love with the fact that such a feeling existed. I wasn't having any of these thoughts. I was just there at the, basically the best I've ever felt. I'm already at the happiest I am, making love to the woman I love, and then suddenly it's this whole different plane of happiness and joy, ladies and gents. There are no wars in the world, no poverty in the world, there's no problems in the world. I've, all my insecurities gone, all my paranoia gone, all my fears gone. I'm basically the happiest I've ever felt in my entire life. And, and the genius of all of this, right, is she didn't give me any warning, right? There was no build-up. Like, if I'd waited 18 years, to do a special move. I'd have dropped a few hints during the day. <laughs> Things like, uh, you don't know what's coming tonight. <laughs> or even right before she did it, what I would have done is kind of gone, uh, five, four, three, two, one, boom. <laughs> Classy move, right? But no, the genius of it was she just, she poker face, she just kept her normal sex face on, which is this. Normal sex space, so I had no idea what was in store. So it's just like an explosion of love and pleasure and joy. I feel like I'm being massaged by fairies. I'm in ecstasy from head to toe. Fucking unicorns are jumping over rainbows, ladies and gents. I'm at the absolute peak of my happiness, peak of joy, the best I've ever felt in my entire life. I've lived 40 years happy on this planet, four great years in this beautiful city, and I found this pure, peak of absolute joy and happiness. And just as I'm having that thought, just as I'm thinking to myself, this is the best I've ever felt, just as I'm thinking, oh my God, it's so amazing to know that a feeling like this exists, my head jerked slightly to the right, and it turned out the dog was licking my ass.
I will be honest with you, St. John. I didn't stop. In actual fact, the next time we made love, I actually rubbed peanut butter around my... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've been James Rollinger. Thank you all very, very much indeed for coming out tonight. You have been a true delight. Uh, you made my dreams come true one more time. Uh, I can't thank you enough. I love this city more than you can imagine, and I love all of you dearly. Uh, thank you very much indeed. You guys are amazing. I've been James Mullinger, and you've been amazing. Thank you very much, and good night. Thank you, St. John. Thank you. Love you. Thank you.